Let's pray together, family church. God, we do recognize that you are holy. You are our God. You are the one true living God, and we are gathered here to meet with you. God, with all of our different stories and all of the things that we've done, the places that we've been, the experiences that we've had, that we all showed up today, and now we need you to come and meet with us and speak to us. God, we've celebrated baptisms. We've celebrated graduating seniors. We've sung songs to you and about you. We've given money to your work. But now, God, would you open your word to us, open our hearts to your word, and teach us and help us to believe that what your word says is true. I pray all these things in Jesus' name and all God's people say, amen. amen. You can be seated. Welcome again to Family Church. My name is Jimmy Scroggins. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, I'm one of the pastors here. I normally do the Bible teaching here at Family Church downtown. And if I haven't had a chance to meet you, I would love to meet you before you leave the premises today. But what we do every week at Family Church is we have a Bible study, which we're going to do right now. So let's go ahead and get our Bibles out. Uh, turn your Bibles on on your devices. Grab a Bible from the pew in front of you and open it up to the book of Romans chapter 1. The book of Romans chapter 1. The book of Romans is like right in the middle of the New Testament. And this is a letter that St. Paul wrote to the church in the ancient city of Rome. He wrote this letter 2,000 years ago, and yet this particular passage we're going to read today seems extremely current. If you're not familiar with the Bible, this is shockingly current. But before we read that text, I do want to say a few things. It is such a joy to be able to gather and have kind of like our family dinner experience every time we get together here on Sundays. And I hope you have as much fun as I do celebrating those graduating seniors. I mean, all of these parents that partner with us and bring their kids here over many, many years, and then we get to celebrate where they're going and what they're doing, all the different schools that they're going to, the, the one going to the Marine Corps. I mean, all of these things are just tremendous, and we get to celebrate that and be a part of all of that as a church family. And then we have these great baptisms. I mean, again, I don't know what's going on with our baptisms, but like it's getting more and more violent every week. I mean, that one lady, that one lady started like getting on the pastor's case. Did you see it when she came up out of the water? She's putting her finger on him because uh, she thought it was a little, little rough out there. But don't worry, at Family Church downtown, Pastor Derek's arranged for you guys to be baptized in Lake Worth over here. Very calm, very pleasant experience, okay, if you want to get baptized at Family Church downtown. Today we're going to talk about God's design for gender and sexuality. God's design for gender and sexuality. There are a, there's a lot of confusion today about gender and sexuality. You guys agree with that? I mean, a lot of people are confused. Uh, in the business world, they're confused. Uh, the president, the, our, our presidential administration, uh, continues to issue new rules and regulations and ways they're trying to look at gender and sexuality that affect our schools, it affects sports, it affects our businesses. So the whole world is confused, and the whole world's talking about what we're going to do with gender and uh, sexuality. And here's what I want you to know. If you are a Christian and you believe the Bible, you should not be confused about these things. The whole world might be confused, but of all the people at your work, all the people in your school, if you are a Bible-believing Christian, there's no reason for you to be confused. But that doesn't mean that you don't have things that you have to deal with. There are lots of things that you have to deal with. For instance, you're going to go to your work, you're going to be around family, you're going to be around friends, you're going to have to decide what you are going to do about pronouns. That's a big thing. Some of you where you work, you got to have your pronouns in your bio. Some of you have been in environments where you had to put name tags on with your pronouns. Uh, some of you have some people that are in your life that are, that are trans or are transitioning, and they've asked you to refer to them uh, in a different way than, than you used to. What are you going to do about that? What are you going to do about your cousin's gay wedding when you're invited as a Christian? Are you supposed to go? Are you supposed to send a gift? Are you supposed to be mad? Like, what, what do you do? <clears throat> How do you handle it? What about if you are experiencing same-sex attraction or someone in your family, maybe one of your kids is experiencing same-sex attraction, what are you going to do with that and where does that, where does that come from? What if somebody's living with a boyfriend or a girlfriend or sleeping together and you're Christians, but you're sleeping together and you're not married, what do you do with that? How does that actually uh, work? And what about when my sister, <clears throat> my gay sister and, and her partner come over to our house for Thanksgiving? What do we tell our kids? How do we manage that? Do we let them come over? What, what, what do we do? So these are all things that you have to, and I'm not going to answer every one of these questions with some kind of blanket prescription because every situation is unique and every context is different. But I will say this, you should have a plan and you should be clear about the fundamental principles about gender and sexuality that we're going to talk about this morning. You should not be unclear. And if there's a way that your church family can help you, uh, your pastors, we would love to talk to you about these things. If you get in a situation, you're not sure what to do, reach out to us. We want to talk to you about it. We're eager to talk to you about it. We're not going to push you down or push you out or make you feel like a loser if you don't do exactly what we say. But we are just going to try to say, hey, look, let's talk about this from the Bible and let's see if we can come 
to a, biz, a biblical conclusion. Now, what I do want to do is give you these clear principles. Before I do, I want you to know I love you. I'm honored to be one of your pastors. And more important than me loving you, God loves you. And I am for you and God is for you. And these principles are for your good. And if you teach them to your children, they'll be for the good of your children. Let's read from Romans chapter 1, verse 16. This is what St. Paul wrote to the ancient church in the city of Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they are without excuse." For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And this is the word of God. In a family church, we say, amen. We receive God's word. Do you see how current that is? Do you see how current that is? I mean, that could be written today. And so what is St. Paul saying? He's talking about gender and sexuality. I don't have time to talk about every single thing I would like to talk about from this text of scripture, but I do want to point out to you Three things that are going to guide our conversation about gender and sexuality. St. Paul says when you begin to sin in these areas, here's what happens. Number one, you begin to ignore the obvious. You ignore what is obvious. That's what he said in verse 20. And then you begin to suppress the truth. Suppress the truth. That's what he says in verse 18. And then you begin to exchange the truth of God for a lie. You see that pattern right there? You, you, you ignore what is obvious. You suppress what is true, and then you exchange the truth for a lie. And now here's what St. Paul is saying. is what the Bible is teaching from Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, and St. Paul is picking it up. God made human beings in his own image. We talked about that. He made human beings in his own image, and he gave every one of us a human body. It's either a male body or a female body, and our male and female bodies are both made in God's image. And every one of us has either one or the other. Every single person in the room, like I want you to look around the room, look at all the people sitting around. You see all those people? I mean, some of them are old, young. Uh, some, some, I mean, there are people in all different kinds of shape and people everywhere. All right, so everybody that came to church today, 
All of us came in a body. You agree with that, right? I mean, there's no disembodied people here at church. Everybody showed up. You got here in your body. You walked in here. You are in a body right now because God gave you a body. And every single person in the room, you either have a male body or you have a female body. Everybody in the room, and you can probably tell the people who are sitting next to you which one they're going with, okay? Now, our bodies are part of God's design for our existence. So what we do with our bodies is really, really, really important to God. What we do with our bodies either acknowledges God, that he's designed our male or female bodies to work a certain way and to do certain things. We acknowledge him and what he's designed our bodies to do, or we reject what God has designed our bodies to do. That, that's that's what he's saying. And Christians think that our bodies matter because what we do with our bodies, especially sexually, actually reflects whether or not we're honoring God and acknowledging God and following his design. Now, modern society is trying to teach you that your body is not very important. Modern society is teaching you your body is just an accidental collection of parts that have evolved over time, that your body has no meaning. And the real you that really matters isn't your body. The real you that really matters is in here. This is the real you. This is just your body. So if the real you decides that the real you doesn't like your body, what should you do about it? Ignore the obvious, suppress the truth, and exchange the truth of God for a lie. Your body is just a collection of disposable parts. And even some of you have been in church for a while. You may have heard somebody say, oh, nobody cares about the body. The body doesn't mean anything. The body's just my earth suit. You ever heard anybody say that? The body's just my earth suit. This is just what I'm wearing. The real me's in here. But that's not what Christians believe. Christians believe that God knit us together in our mother's womb. And when he did, God designed, hands-on designed our bodies. Our bodies are not just the person that is inside. It's the person that is inside our consciousness, our soul, our mind, our spirit. Plus, it's attached to a body. And your body is very important to God. Your body's so important. This is what the Bible teaches for Christians. Your body is so important that one day, your body that you have right now, when you die, is going to be raised from the dead. And you're going to live forever in heaven in that body that you have. Now, some of you are like, I don't know if I like that. I was hoping for kind of an upgrade. Some of us that have been living in our bodies for a long time, the longer you live in the body, the more you're thinking, I would like an upgrade. My body's not working as good as it used to. I don't have to go to the barber anymore. What happened to that? Uh, my, my back hurts. My joints hurt. All, all kinds of things begin to break down. And you think, I don't want... Yeah, but what's going to happen is if you're a believer in Jesus, when you die, one day Jesus is going to return. He's going to raise your body from the dead. The one that you have right now, and it's going to be a raised from the dead body, a resurrection body, your body only better. So instead, like I'm in my 50s. You know, you peak in like your 20s. And after you get through your 20s, you do everything you can. But it's downhill from there. I mean, it's just, it's just how hard are you fighting? But that's how it is. But when you get your resurrection body, you're going to be in Peak condition, only better than you've ever been forever. Because your body is important to God. And what you do with your body really matters. That's why when people say, when they use their body sexually, they say, that was no big deal. That was just sex. You ever heard anybody say that? Some of you said that yourself. It wasn't a big deal. It was just sex. It was just some of my body parts rubbing up against somebody else's body parts, didn't mean anything. It was just sex. But for the Christian, we know that there is no just sex because our body is a whole thing, and it really matters. And what we do with our body really matters. That's why St. Paul said this way for a Christian. This is what St. Paul said, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. St. Paul said, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? You're not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. What you do with your body really matters. Romans chapter 1 says that the ultimate sign of brokenness in an individual person or in a society is when they give up the natural use of the body and use it in unnatural ways. And then St. Paul warns us at the end of Romans chapter 1, don't be the person who does that with your body, but also don't be someone who gives approval to people who do that with their body. So as a Christian, it's not just about what you do. 
It's about what you give approval of. Now, look, we all want to be inclusive. We all want to care about people. And I want you to know all of us have uh, gay family members and trans friends and people who are same-sex attracted. And all of us have people and friends and kids and all that. So we want to be loving. We want to be caring. We want to push people out. We don't want to push people down. We don't want to denigrate anybody because every single one of these people that we love was made in the image of God. And they are worthy of love and dignity and honor and respect. And we want to show that to them. We want them to feel that. So we want to be as inclusive as we can. But being inclusive doesn't mean affirming something that God says is contrary to his design. Now, in just next month or so, you're going to see a lot of this flag popping up all over the world. Have you guys noticed that before? What do you call that flag right there? What do you call that? Yeah, a pride flag. Pride in what? I mean, all the initials, right? I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot. You know what that flag really is? And I, I know some people fly the flag or have it at their business or whatever because they want to make sure everyone feels affirmed and inclusive. I want people to feel uh, included because I want people to know they're welcome, they're loved. We're not putting people down, but I will tell you this. This flag is designed to declare we are rejecting God's design for gender and sexuality. This is a flag that declares the rejection of God's design for gender and sexuality. Now, again, all of us have people in our life. So here's the question that you have to ask yourself. Ready? There's, there's kind of three options the way I see it. Either A, you say, I agree that there is a designer, God, and he has a design for my body. And because I agree with that, I need to follow God's design. I'm not saying you're following it perfectly. But if there is a design and there is a designer, you need to follow God's design for your body. That's, one of the, that's option A. Option B would be somebody who says, I agree there's probably a design and a designer. I'm just not doing it. I'm not going to be constricted by somebody's rules. I'm going to do whatever I want. I agree that there is a God and he's designed my body a certain way, but I'm going to do whatever I want. There is a designer and I'm going to try to follow it. There is a design. I'm just not going to follow it. Or C, I don't think there's a design at all and I can do whatever I want. Those are the three options as I see it. And so if you're going to be a Christian person and you're going to live in this society, you're going to have to figure out which one are you. Are you agreeing that there is a design and you're going to try to follow it? Are you agreeing that there's a design and you're just going to do what you want and take whatever consequences God has? Or are you saying, I don't really think there's a design anyway. I can do whatever I want. Those are the options as I see it. And so I'm going to teach you today five principles. These are truths about gender and sexuality from the Bible. These are truths that we teach at Family Church. If you hang around, uh, if, you, if you put your kids in kids' ministry, they're going to learn a kids-appropriate version of these truths. They go to student ministry, they're going to learn this. College ministry, single, single adults. If you've been around here before, I've heard those five things before. Stick around, you're going to hear them again because these are the five things we think are very helpful in thinking about gender and sexuality. Moms and dads especially, grandmas and grandpas, you ought to know these principles because you ought to be able to teach them to your children. You ought to be able to teach them to your children. Okay, here we go. Number one, first principle. Biological sex and gender should match. Biological sex and gender should match. Your biological sex is what you are biologically. It has to do with your anatomy. It has to do with your biology. That is your biological sex. It's determined in the womb. Your gender, the way our society describes it, is your experience and expression of maleness or femaleness. So your biological sex is your actual biological maleness or femaleness. Gender the way our society defines it, is your experience or expression of maleness or femaleness. And what we're saying is those two things should not be separated. You have your biological sex, which is designed by God, assigned by God in the womb. So you need to try to bring your gender, your experience and expression of maleness or femaleness into line with God's design, which you can see when you look at your body. That, that's what you should be trying to do. You shouldn't be trying to drag your body over to whatever you're thinking in here Drag what's in here over to what God has designed when he designed your, your body. That, that's a better way to do it. Now, you say, well, I don't understand why that's such a big deal. Look, our whole society is hardwired to know the difference between a boy and a girl, and we even celebrate it. You know what's crazy? On social media, all of these young couples that uh, actually, uh, they, they'll have a pride flag uh, one day, and they'll celebrate the rejection of God's design, but then when they go and get pregnant, they go and get an ultrasound, and they figure out what it is, and then they have a gender reveal party, and they post that on social media. Think about what a gender reveal party actually is. I mean, they, they, got, they got this, you know, baseball that's like blue, and they throw it to the guy, and he hits the baseball, and it turns into blue powder. Oh, it's a boy. If it's a girl, they throw a pink when he hits it. Boom, it's, a, it's pink powder. Oh, it's a girl. 
Now, I'm just, I'm, you can say this out loud. How did they, what do you call the machine that tells you, boy or girl, what do you call that machine? It's kind of a test. You call it a ultrasound, right? And how do they know when they look at the ultrasound, the pictures of the baby in the womb, how do they know if it's a boy? Because they see a little pee-pee in there. They, they see it, they see it. And then they know that's a boy. That's how they tell. It's obvious. Don't ignore the obvious. When you see the little pee-pee, you don't have a gender reveal party and go, we don't know. <laughs> it's obvious. Don't suppress, don't ignore the obvious. Don't suppress the truth and don't exchange the truth for life. Because here's what's going to happen. This little boy, you know what he is. That's why he had the gender reveal party. But then when he gets a little bit older, you're going to say, hey, I know your biology and your anatomy tells you that you're a boy. But if you want to, we'll help you exchange the truth. You're a boy for a lie, you're really a girl. You see that? And that's the danger. That's what our society is doing. So some of you are too young to remember this. Some of you are older than me, but hey, back in the 70s when I was a little kid, the number one athlete in the world was Bruce Jenner. He was everybody's hero. He was on the cover of Wheaties boxes. He was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. This guy was in all the TV commercials. He was the greatest, most celebrated athlete in America in the early 70s. Bruce Jenner. All of you younger kids are like, oh, I didn't realize that. I know her as Caitlyn Jenner. Famous for doing nothing, but there, there she is, you know. So listen, this is what they're trying to teach you. You don't like your body parts? Chop them off. Add this. Add that. You don't like your hormones? You don't like the way your chemistry is? Let's change it to the beauty of modern technology. Be whatever you want. If the real you in here doesn't like the body that God gave you when you were in the womb, change it. Do whatever you want. But Pastor Jimmy, don't you think that if they would be happy changing their body, don't you want people to be happy? I actually do want people to be happy, but here's the thing about it. The data suggests that changing all of that stuff doesn't actually make you happy. The data suggests that's an illusion. You know why? Because you're ignoring the obvious, suppressing the truth, and exchanging the truth of God for a lie, and you will receive in your own body the due penalty for your error. That's what St. Paul is saying in Romans chapter 1. So here's some data from a book by a guy named John Mark Comer. John Mark Comer did a study. He figured out happiness levels have been in decline in the United States since the 1960s. If the sexual revolution is so successful, why are people less happy than ever before? I also found that those who cohabitate before marriage are less likely to actually get married and more likely to get a divorce if they do and often develop long-term trust issues. Research shows that sex reassignment surgery and hormone therapy for those who identify as transgender do not benefit their emotional health, which is the main rationale behind them. People are less happy after all this surgery and hormone therapy than they were before. You say, well, Pastor Jimmy, those are just Christian preacher statistics. Fine, do your own research, and you know what you're going to find? That's all legit, and it's all true. Because these things do not make people more happy. They make them less happy. They do not help people thrive. They make them less likely to thrive, and you should not participate in somebody who's trying to ignore the obvious, suppress the truth, and exchange the truth for a lie. And that's why we shouldn't use the wrong pronouns. You say, well, you just called Caitlyn Jenner she. That was an accident. He's a he. He's a he. How do you know he's a he? Because I used to see him on the Wheaties box, man. <laughs> you shouldn't use the wrong pronouns for people when you can help it. And here's why I wouldn't. If you, if you said to me, well, Pastor Jimmy, I'm transitioning. I used to be a, a man. Now I'm a woman. Will you please call me? I will not. You know why I won't? Because God made you a man. That's the truth. You, you deciding that you're a woman is a lie. And I am not going to help you ignore the obvious, suppress the truth, and exchange the truth for a lie. But don't you love me? Yeah, I do love you. I love you so much. I don't agree that living a lie is good for you. I love you so much that I don't believe and I don't agree that living a lie is good for you. Now look, some of you are going to get confused. Somebody's kids are going to get confused. It happens in our church. If that happens, I promise you this. We're not going to push anybody down. We're not going to push anybody out. You come talk to us confidentially. We want to help people who are confused. We're not trying to make fun of people. We're not trying to ostracize people. We are in it to help. You say, well, no one in our church has ever done that before. False. 
We have kids and adults in all kinds of situations. In fact, we have a whole group and a whole system of helping support, particularly parents whose kids are going through things, and it's all confidential. You come see us. We will help you. That is our goal. Hey, number two on your notes. Heterosexual attraction is God's design and our goal. Heterosexual attraction is God's design and our goal. In uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, St. Paul says that St. Paul says that heterosexual attraction is natural and homosexual attraction is contrary to nature. He says it about women, then he says it about men. You say, well, that's kind of harsh. That's kind of old school. Like, why would you say natural and unnatural and all that stuff? Here's why. Just think about it. Use, use your mind for a second. The design of the human body. Now, I believe that God designed the human body. And so the design of the human body tells you that men are made, their bodies are literally designed to fit together sexually with a woman. A man's body is not designed to fit together sexually with a man, nor is a woman's body designed to fit together sexually with a woman. It's just not designed that way. And even if you're not a Christian and you're an evolutionist, evolutionists should be the last ones to affirm this because homosexuality is absolutely contrary to everything evolution believes. How can you propagate the species Unless a man gets together with a woman. So the body's design itself, however you believe it got there, should tell you that heterosexual attraction should be the design and it should be our goal. Now, I know that people do in our church struggle with same-sex attraction. We have people who are uh, getting saved and they're leaving a gay lifestyle behind. We have people in all kinds of situations and that's real. And why are people like that? It's some combination of how your genetics are wired combined with things that have happened to you, many of which are not your choice, combined with choices that you have indeed made. And somehow all of that fits together and makes you how you are. And if you're experiencing same-sex attraction, again, we're not going to push you down or push you out. We're going to pull you in and lift you up. We care about you. We love you. We're never going to make fun of you or mock you. We're going to help you, but you should come see us and let us try to redirect your attention toward the truth of God's design, which is that you are made, you are physically made for heterosexual attraction, and we want to help you move that direction as much as we can. Because here's the deal. When you reject God's design, you are rejecting God. That's what Romans 1 is telling you. When you reject the design, you reject the designer, and the designer is God. Well, what do we do with uh, family members that are gay? And what do we do when they want to come over? Here's what I advise you to do. If you have family members that are same-sex attracted or living a gay lifestyle, here's what you should do. Love them, love them, love them, love them. Be kind to them. Fight for the relationship. Never put them down. Never push them out. You fight, 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 fight for the relationship as hard as you can without affirming sinful things. Fight for the relationship as hard as you can without affirming sinful sinful things. Well, what do I do with my kids when Aunt Sally wants to come over with her partner, Beth? Well, I would have Aunt Sally over and I would just tell the kids, hey, listen, this is Aunt Sally. We love Aunt Sally. She loves you. She loves you so much and we love her so much. But you know, God has a design for how this is all supposed to work. And Aunt Sally and Beth aren't following God's design right now, but we love them. We're praying for them. We're going to be kind to them. We never want to say anything that's going to hurt their feelings. They know where we stand on this. They know where we're at, but we love them. We care about them. We're going to fight for the relationship so that if they ever get to a position where they want to repent of their sins and return to God's design, we want to be there to help them do it. And you can't do it if you've destroyed the relationship because what we're dealing with is sin. You understand that. I mean, this is sin. Uh, departing from God's design when it comes to gender and sexuality, it, it is sin. Homosexuality is a uh, sin against God. Transgenderism is a sin against God and his design. If you are sleeping with someone heterosexually that you are not married to, it is a sin against God and his design for you. And what we need to do with our sins is not just commit to our sins, turn from our sins, repent of our sins, confess our sins, turn to Christ, receive the forgiveness that Jesus has purchased for us when his body was broken and his blood was shed and you can be forgiven. And whatever you've been doing, whatever your story is, man, you can be forgiven. There's no scarlet letter around here. There are no unforgivable sins in these things. You turn to Christ, you can be forgiven and you can begin to recover and pursue God's design from right here, right now. And if you're struggling, come see us, we'll help you. Number three on your notes. Sexual expression and experience are for marriage. Sexual expression and experience are for marriage. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but here's the thing. Some of you are saying, Pastor Jimmy, 2024, 
Are we still doing the thing where you're not supposed to have sex with people you're not married to or we're we not doing that anymore? Like, what's going on with that? Still doing that? Still doing it. It's in the Bible and it's the best for you. God's not trying to keep something from you. God's trying to keep something for you. And here's why. When you have sex someone, with someone, it's not just your body parts touching their body parts. It's a whole thing. God made sex to bind you to another person. God made sex to, to bind you to another person. And you can't just keep getting bound to all these different people and bound to all these different people and bound to all these different people. That's why hookup culture is so destructive. That's why pornography is so destructive. You run around getting bound to all these people and ripping the bonds apart and then acting like you're just supposed to go along. That's why people are devastated emotionally. That's why they're dealing with so much anxiety. That's why people are so ruined when it comes to relationships. And if you do that enough and your body count gets high enough, what'll happen to you is your conscience will get seared and you will no longer be able to feel anything. You'll just be physically and emotionally and sexually numb. And that's a shame because that's not what you're designed for. I mean, you're designed one man, one woman for life. And some of you are like, dude, <laughs> too late. You got here too late, pastor. What am I supposed to do now? I've already done all this stuff. And what now? This is the great thing about Jesus Christ, man. Jesus is crucified on the cross for your sins. And whatever your sins are and whatever your story is, you can be completely washed and forgiven of everything that has happened. God doesn't erase your past, but he will give you a new start. And you can begin right here, right now. You, you can repent of your sins and you can begin to recover and pursue God's design from right here, right now, today. And if that's you, you should do that. You should do it. And you can. Because God wants us to experience sex in the context of total commitment and total union. When you have sex with somebody you're not married to, it's a kind of a commitment, but it's only a partial commitment. A total commitment is marriage. Separating sex from marriage is a sin. It makes it, look, if you're committed enough to have sex, why don't you be committed enough to get married? Now, some of you guys are living together right now, sleeping together, whatever, and you're like, what, what, what do you want me to do? Well, I want you to get married. Well, I'm never going to marry him. I'm never going to marry her. Then I want you to move out. That's what I want you to do. I think the best thing for you. Stop sleeping together if you're not going to get married. If you're going to get married, get married. Pastor Jimmy, we can't afford to get married. I'm in charge of this whole place. I'll do it for free. You should get married. Okay. <laughs> so, you, and again, don't beat yourself up for any of this. You can recover and pursue God's design from right here, right now. Number four on your notes, Christians should date and marry other Christians. Christians should date and marry other Christians. What gives you the right to say that? It's what God's word says. God's word is giving you a pattern. Uh, this is in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. St. Paul said, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness? So this is a pattern. This is St. Paul's teaching you. If you're a Christian, you want to live the Christian life, the best thing for you to do is marry Someone else who's a Christian. You say, I'm not getting married. I'm dating. Okay, but 100% of you are going to marry someone that you date. You see, see what I'm saying? So it's kind of, right? So it's kind of like, I'm not going to marry them. I'm going to date. I know. But if you set a pattern in your life where you start dating a bunch of people who don't share the number one thing about you, which is your relationship with Jesus Christ, why would you engage in a relationship like that where you're going to get in love and you're going to get physical and all these things are going to happen and you don't share the number one thing in your life, which is Jesus? You say, well, I know someone and if she wouldn't have dated him or he wouldn't have dated her, they wouldn't have become a Christian. I, I know. Thank God that some of you, that is your story. Your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend led you to Christ and now you're a believer and if it wasn't for them, that never would have happened. But you know who's not in the room? All the people who got pulled away from Christ. They're nowhere to be found. And I'm telling you, you would be wise. And moms and dads, you would be wise to encourage your kids to date and marry other Christians as much as you can. Pastor Jimmy, don't you know? We can't tell our kids who they can date. They're too old. Like, they got to make their own shit. You're right. Look, I've got kids too. A bunch of kids. <laughs> and they've been on a bunch of dates and they weren't all with Christians. Well, what do we do? So here's what my advice you to do. I'd advise you moms and dads to say, this is what I think is best for you. This is what I think God's word is teaching. I think it would be better for you if you would date and marry Christians. But 
if they choose to do, make their own decisions, I'm not sure I would draw a bunch of red lines and go crazy with it, okay? But I would be clear, this is what would be the best. This is what I think would be the best for you. And I would give them wisdom and advice and point them that direction because I think that's what God's word is telling us. Last thing, number five on your notes. If you get married, marriage is for life. Marriage is for life. You know, right here in this room yesterday, we had a wedding. I got to do the wedding. I love doing weddings. That's one of my favorite things about my job. And I stood right in this room right here, right here. And they stood here. Now, the bride was an hour late. <laughs> hour late, not making that up. The crowd thought it was runaway bride. They thought, they thought she was. She, she, she did. She ended up showing up, had the wedding. I love that part where I say, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Because that's the kind of commitment that's supposed to be involved when you get together with another person. And that's the kind of commitment that God shows us. When God loves us, God receives us into his family. We're part of a family, and God's never going to turn his back on us or reject us. And that's why when you have a marriage, it's so important, so powerful. You, you love fiercely, and you forgive easily, and you restore quickly, and you fight for it and stay in there. When you do that, that's what God does for us. That's why marriage is supposed to point us to Christ. And some of you in this room are thinking, man, in our family, it's a mess, or in your own life, maybe you've made choices, or you've gotten connected with porn, or you've slept around, or you've gotten, I don't know what your story is. But whatever it is, I'll tell you this, Jesus Christ is still crucified on the cross for sinners. And Jesus Christ is still raised from the dead. And whatever your story is, God can forgive you, and God can begin to heal the broken places in your life. But will you agree? There is a designer. He has a design. Let's follow God's design from here. Let's follow God's design from here. And if you never received Jesus, you should receive Jesus for yourself today. You should turn from your sins and receive Jesus by faith. And you can, and we'll help you do that. And you might think this, well, I can't do that because this church is full of perfect people and none of them have ever done any of the stuff that I've done. That is a joke. This church is full of people who would tell you the story. That's who I used to be, but then I met Christ, and I'm a whole different person. And ever since I met Christ, everything I've been doing is totally different. I'm a different kind of man. I'm a different kind of woman because I met Christ. And that can be your story too. should be because of Jesus. And to remind us of how powerful Jesus is in changing us and saving us and cleansing us from our sins, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. We do that every single week at Family Church. We're going to do it right now. The Lord's Supper is a way we remember the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus for our sins. Now, the Lord's Supper is for believers in Jesus. If you're a believer in Jesus today, the Lord's Supper is for you. But the Lord's Supper is also for people we believe and we teach who have been baptized and who become a part of a neighborhood church. Now, if you're here today and you say, well, I'm a Christian. This isn't my church. I'm here as a guest or a visitor. If you're a believer in Jesus and you would take the Lord's Supper at your church, take it with us today as part of the extended family of Jesus that goes around the world. If you're not a believer in Jesus, I don't recommend that you take the Lord's Supper. Why don't you wait until you make your own decision of faith and then you can eat and drink as part of the family of God and do so with integrity. But right now, I'd like us just to lean in. Let's thank God for his mercy. Let's thank God for his grace. Let's thank God that he didn't leave us how we were and he's changed us to how he wants us to be. So let's confess our sins. Let's thank God for his design for our lives. Let's lean into the Lord. And then in just a minute, we'll eat and drink together. Without hope of redemption Blind to my need for Savior Oh, but God Crushed by the weight of my failure 
Thank you for being the church in here with us at Family Church at Home. Right now, all in-person neighborhood churches are about to take the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a family meal for those who are baptized believers. To learn more about baptism as your next step, check out a neighborhood church near you and plan your visit today at gofamilychurch.org. We'd love to connect with you face to face. Don't forget, next week is Mother's Day. We hope that you will make plans this week to visit your neighborhood church. We would love to meet you. I hope you have an amazing week ahead, Family Church.